Terry, let's take just a minute to review where we are in terms of our reading of this complicated but rich letter. We started out by saying that one of the purposes of the letter is to introduce Paul to a congregation he doesn't know, uh, partly to bless him as he passes through Rome on his way to Spain, where I think he feels he'll conclude his mission, uh, partly to get their blessing for the offering he's taking to Jerusalem, and probably partly to help them think through what it means to be a Jewish Christian and a Gentile Christian. We'll come back to the word Christian in a minute, but Gentile believer, Christian believer in Jesus Christ. That then in chapters 1 to 3, what Paul needs to do, does do successfully, I think, is set up the claim that everybody needs Jesus. And the reason everybody needs Jesus is that everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God in his language. Uh, Jews by breaking of the law, Gentiles by their idolatry, which, which breaks a law written on their hearts, uh, the law of the creator God who can't be confused with God's creations. Uh, and, and so what is going to redeem people is Jesus Christ. And the way one relates to Jesus Christ is twofold. It's through Christ's own faithfulness, Christ's faithful obedience to God, but also our faithful loyalty to Jesus Christ, who is faithful to God. The word faith gets tossed around in lots of ways. And then Abraham becomes the first great type or illustration of that kind of belief because he trusts in God's promise to bring forth out of his own barren, out of Sarah's barrenness and his own age the gift of Isaac. And that becomes a promise of what God will do in Jesus Christ, which is to bring forth a blessing out of nothingness and life out of death. And when, when Abraham trusts that, then it's counted to him as righteousness. He moves into a right relationship with God. That becomes an example for the Roman believers. Mm -hmm. So that's, right. I think, where we are at the end of chapter 4. Thanks for that update. You're most welcome. You use the term Christian. Yes, yeah, sorry Could about you that. reflect on that just a little yeah. bit? Does Paul have the category Paul of Christian? Paul does not have the category of Christian. Paul's standard way of talking about believers are those who are in Christ. And what he wants to insist in Romans, as in his other letters, is that Gentiles can be in Christ just as much as Jews can be in Christ, and that in Christ they find their identity. It leads to a whole bunch of puzzles, which is, who did Paul think he was religiously? Um, my assumption is he thought he was a Jew who was in Christ, not that he was this new thing called a Christian. But that's a huge puzzle for another day when I will simply listen to your wisdom on it, because I sure haven't figured it out. <laughs> no, I certainly agree with you. In Christ is the operative category. In Christ is the operative category. And he wants to insist that both uh, Jews and non-Jews, yeah. Gentiles, uh, can be part of that reality exactly. of uh, exactly. what it is to be and, in And just a quick nod to that, that that's not simply a semantic difference. To be in Christ is, has to do with one's whole identity, one's whole being, one's relational, uh, re, one's relational aspect in terms of God, in terms of Christ. I mean, it's one thing to say you and I are Christian. That's fair enough. It's where we go to church and where we pay our tithes. But to say that we're in Christ is to say our lives are defined by that relationship, and I think he wants to make that stronger claim. Mm -hmm. Christian can weaken it, I think, for him. Right. It's interesting to think about this in language that yeah. Paul uses, and we'll be bumping up against some of it a little bit later in Romans. There's also Christ in us as we Absolutely. are in Christ. Absolutely. And he is explicit about that. Yeah. I live now, not uh, I, but Christ in me. In, in Christ in me, yeah. yeah. Um, and some people have talked about this as a kind of participatory yeah. uh, mysticism. Or Christ uh, mysticism, yeah. yeah. I don't know if mysticism is the right word, but relationality is certainly the right word. It's, it is more, as we said back at the beginning, belief is more than what you do intellectually. Mm -hmm. It has to do with where you put your soul. And uh, the participation language, I think, helps in that in Paul. Mm -hmm. I, wanted to, I wanted to move on from Abraham. I mean, you said, I think, quite rightly that we need to see uh, at the end of chapter 3 that Paul thinks he's sustaining the law. And he's sustaining the law because f for him, law doesn't just mean a bunch of rules. Law means Torah. What, what does Moses say about the truth? And he thinks, uh, contemporary Hebrew scholars to the contrary notwithstanding, that he's a pretty smart interpreter of the Torah. He said that Abraham prefigures those who are in Christ. Now in chapter 5, he has another big prefiguration, and that's Adam. And what does he, what does he do with Adam in chapter 5? Before I answer your question on it. Adam, I, I want to just say a word about uh, the beginning of chapter 5. Good. And uh, pick up on some of this relational okay. uh, business that we've been talking about. Okay. Because uh, one of the things that, uh, that happens between 4 and 5 is that Paul shifts his metaphors. Yeah. If in chapter 4 the main metaphor is reckoning or justification, yeah. which comes from the legal, legal sphere, language, yeah. uh, what Paul produ uh, uses here at the beginning of chapter 5 is relational language Very about, nice. uh, about uh, reconciliation. Very nice. And uh, he's probably picking this up uh, from some of his uh, work in, in Second Corinthians yeah. in particular, which was all about getting reconciled yeah. to a community that had uh, 
uh, severed its relationships with him. Was truly annoyed at him, yeah. yeah. And so uh, ju just look at the way in which he opens this. Therefore, since we, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access. Uh, this is uh, almost uh, the language of uh, patron-client relationships. It is. We have, how, how, we do have I, way yeah, into how do I get into the house? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Uh, this relationship has an eschatological dimension. Yep. That's going to loom larger Harsh, and larger very. as uh, the, the argument moves on. Yep. Um, and, and it also has an ethical dimension, right? And he goes into that in verse 3. Not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. So here's the hope theme yep. uh, built upon the, the transformation of character yep. that uh, comes from this life of faith. And just quickly, the Holy Spirit, who will right. who will also reappear before yeah. long. So uh, a, a rich uh, collection of tapestry of yeah, of it is a tapestry, yeah, that, uh, a melange. Use, yes. yeah. um, and then the reconciliation language and what uh, what follows. Okay, so that's the introduction okay, yep, here. Okay, absolutely. And, uh, I think it's helpful to to see all of this because Paul talks in more than one way, as you pointed out yep. before, uh, about uh, what has happened um, uh, through Christ yep. in our absolutely. relationship with God. Uh, so, in verse 12, he picks up on um, the, the Adam typology, and this is something he had used once before in 1 Corinthians when he was worried about uh, uh, what resurrection means, and it might be useful to think about that for just a moment mm -hmm. because in 1 Corinthians 15, he had been challenged by some people in the Corinthian community who were denying the reality of right. resurrection. Right. And so, Paul wants to say, no, it is a reality, even if it's going to be different from anything that we can, we can imagine. Uh, and he's, he uses the uh, Adam Christ typology to say God created Adam in the first place as a living being. God created the new Adam Christ in a very new way, yeah. a spiritual being. Yeah. And we share in that. Yeah. Uh, but here he's not uh, making an argument about um, resurrection. He's making an argument about sin, which has been the, uh, uh, the dominating theme since uh, the first couple of chapters. And uh, he wants to say, uh, wants to reaffirm that sin is a universal reality, yeah. and that God's gracious action in dealing with it trumps it, no matter how Absolutely. pervasive and right. how, uh, how deleterious the, the fact of sin has been, uh, the fact of God's grace uh, is far Always superior. Always far surpasses it. So that's the fundamental uh, yeah. move that he wants to make. Uh, and in, in doing that, he goes back to the beginning, to, to Adam and to the story in, in Genesis. He's, the Bible is, is uh, resonating here in, in his arguments throughout. Hugely. Sometimes yeah, in, in the form of uh, specific quotations, yeah. sometimes in, uh, just by allusion to the absolutely. story. Yeah. So he alludes to the story of the, um, uh, the first sin in yeah. the garden um, and uh, does so in verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned. And then he does uh, yeah. one of his uh, broken up sentences, right. <laughs> as he often does. He, his thought moves faster than his grammar yeah, in some cases. Exactly. Uh, but then he, uh, he, I, I want to go back to, to what he says though, in that first yeah. verse. Yeah, I do too. Because this is often taken to be um, uh, a proof text for uh, a doctrine of original yeah. sin. And um, it, that uh, doctrine was aided, actually, in the Latin tradition because of a different translation uh, or a different uh, way of rendering the end of that verse. Instead of, because all have sinned, it's in whom all have, all have sinned, sinned, right? which is actually a mistranslation of, of the Greek. Greek. Yeah. So Paul doesn't, uh, doesn't have that notion of original sin in the same way in which it will be developed by Augustine. Right. He does have a notion that sin is a universal reality, and there's a scriptural warrant for that in the story of Adam. And he's already showed us in chapters one and two how that That's right. plays out in the Roman community. That's right. And yeah. uh, I think it's clear how he thinks about this in the next verse, um, that people sin like Ad Adam. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Not yeah. so much because of yeah. Adam. Yeah. So Adam, like Abraham, is a type. He represents uh, some aspect of, of human reality. Um, and uh, on the other side, we have the free gift, the free gift of God's uh, reconciling love in Christ um, that uh, trumps um, sin. Um, now, the other thing that's going on here as Paul is, is wrestling with this, uh, uh, this uh, reality of sin and the reality of God's grace is the law. Yep. Right? And uh, one thing about these, these several chapters from um, the end of chapter 3 on is Paul is building up to what, what will be his, his uh, final attempt to reconcile the, the, the goodness of the law 
uh, with the inability of the law yeah, to, to affect a yeah. relationship with God. Yeah. That's his position on the matter. Uh, and he'll do that in chapter 7. So yeah. he's preparing the way for this. Yeah. Uh, and he does so um, in verse 20 of chapter 5. But the law came in with the result that trespass multiplied. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that just as sin exercised dominion in death, so grace might also exercise dominion through justification leading to eternal life in Jesus Christ. Yeah. So he's celebrating the reality at the same time as noting something about the law. The law is not a way of dealing, in his mind, with the reality of sin. It just multiplies yeah. it. Don't you, I think, or I won't do the don't you mm -hmm. think, I think this is still his reading of Genesis 2 and 3, mm -hmm. that, that Adam and Eve's sin is multiplied because now they do it against the law. They don't just do the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. They do the wrong thing against an explicit commandment. Right. Don't eat that. And then they say, eat it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. He'll be alluding to that episode very specifically. In, in, yeah, in and I think it's already creeping in. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let, can I ask you sure. the toughest question, which we didn't prepare for an answer, so I'm looking forward to your answer. On verse 18, yeah. therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life, not just for those in Christ, mm -hmm. but for all. What do you do with that sneaking mm -hmm. universalism mm -hmm. in Paul's claims? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that's going on here is an anticipation of the uh, arguments he's going to be mounting in chapters 9 okay. through 12. Yeah. And um, his, I, don't, I think we misread Paul if we um, try to make him into a 19th or 20th century rationalist yeah. uh, who's re wrestling with the, the problem of uh, singularity versus universality. Yeah, yeah. What in happens to the Hindu? Yeah. That's right. right. Uh, I think uh, Paul has the sense that God's um, uh, will is to bring all of humankind yeah. into relationship with God, and that God has provided a way of doing so uh, through the, uh, the graciousness of his, his gift and through the faithful response to yeah. that gracious uh, gift in Christ. Yeah. And that that is the one way in which all can uh, relate to yeah. God through accepting God's gracious yeah. gift. Uh, for uh, you know, modern theologians and, uh, and church folk, uh, the issue is, is that one way confined only uh, to Christ, or is it the form of the relationship yeah, that's, that's exactly. important? Yeah. The acceptance of God's yeah, graciousness. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, the churches and uh, theologians within the churches divide that. on Absolutely. that. Yeah. But I think Paul's, Paul's vision here is an eschatological vision, yeah. uh, a vision of hope, a vision uh, of uh, a universal relationship of all of humankind uh, with God that works on this fundamental principle, yeah. God's gift, our uh, Faithful response. No, I agree. And I think the one thing that this rules out is the kind of Christianity which says, fortunately, I'm saved and you're not. Mm -hmm. uh, that the hope has to be broader than what happens to you and me. It in that sense, the hope is universal, though the exact shape of that hope, I think, is hard to figure. Right. And it's, it's interesting here uh, to note the language justification and life. Uh, and indeed, Paul will link justification and life, but there's always judgment involved, too. There is. Uh, and to, so the, the language of being saved, although Paul can use that language sometimes uh, to refer to the start of the process. Yeah. Usually it refers to, to the, the end, end of the process. process. Yeah. 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 All right, we'll look more at that soon.